working with me. That was a wonderful administration. You know, it's the kind of administration that you don't even want to preach again. You know, it's, uh, I was greatly blessed by it. Let's put hands together. You know, we believe we are very blessed as a church. Having a choir like this minister to us all of the time. Amen? Praise the Lord. I want to share with us today, breaking your fallow ground. Breaking your fallow ground. The word fallow means a ground that has been left uncultivated. You know, a land that has been left without doing anything with it, you know. So you plow the land and you don't plant seed there. So that's what we mean by fallow ground. I have a message this morning. Please follow me. Amen. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to talk about your principles and talk about your word. Let it just not be mere words of enticement. Let signs and wonder follow this world. Let it be according to the demonstration of your power. Let the people not say they've had a good message. But let everyone, including the preacher, be able to say the Lord has spoken even to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You know, this year we're talking about maximizing potential in him. What does it mean? And of course, we're just going to, I want to use this as a background of where I'm going today. Please follow me, I'm going somewhere. So the word maximize or maximize means to increase to the greatest possible amount or degree. To make the greatest or the fullest use of something. That means you maximize the potential of that thing. What is potential? Because that's where a lot of people have struggled with. Potential simply means dormant ability, untapped strength. Unused success, hidden talents, capped abilities or capability. There is a wealth of potential within you, but you must decide if you would deprive this world or bless it with the valuable potent, untapped resources locked away within you, which God has put there. Potential is the peak of your possible performance at any point in time. It is a prospect of your achievement. That's what potential is. It is a latent, is a latent energy in you. That's what your potential, that's what it is. It is your uncovered capability at every stage in your life. And it is your unused talent. And so, whatever you have achieved, is there still room to grow? Everyone has a potential which is deposited in them by God, by their creator. Maximizing it leads to fulfillment of your life. Your potential is like a gift that is personal to you. God gave you that gift. Your potential is a gift that God gave to you. So Jeremiah 1.5 says it like this. Before I formed thee, this is the Lord speaking to prophet Jeremiah. He says, before I formed thee in the womb, <clears throat> I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. So the assignment I had in this world, I, I thought about that assignment. I decided to call you for that assignment. So potential is not what you have done, but what you are here to do. Potential is not what you have done. It's what you, are, what you are here to do. In other words, what you have done and achieved is no longer your potential. Potential demands that you never settle for what you have accomplished. You never settle for whatever you have accomplished. One of the greatest enemies of potential is success and achievement. So in order to maximize your full potential, you must never be satisfied with your last accomplishment or your last success. And so we believe that this year, like we've been saying since January about maximizing your potential, you cannot let what you have achieved to affect what you can do. When you identify your potential, you use it to provide solutions 
for the needs of others. And then you will never be unemployed. You will be employed and wealthy if you are able to connect your potential with your job. You will be outstanding at your work. I'm going somewhere today. You know, <clears throat> you know people say, uh, if it is not broken, don't fix it. Or people say, you know what, I'm doing well anyway. And there is this saying that says, you don't change a winning team. I'm here to tell you that if it is not broken, it can be upgraded. If it's not broken, it can get better. To deliver a much higher level of performance. So don't say it's not broken. I'm okay the way I am. No, no, no. That is not maximizing your potential. That is the basis why innovation. That's the basis for innovation. Because though these companies like Apple, Samsung, Amazon, they are great organizations, but every time they are still looking that we can do much better than this. That's why an Amazon will be buying Whole Foods. And so you look at the people in the world, they understand what their potentials are, that we have the ability to still do this. Let me put it in a simple way. We still have the ab ability to accommodate this. And this is very important because that's why the world makes it more than those of us in the church. I have a two-part series. I'm preaching this today and next week. Breaking your fallow ground. Proverbs 24, verse 30. Let's move to the second base. Proverbs 24, verse 30. Please, let me put this on the screen. I want you to, Proverbs 24. I want us to look at this text, which will be what we'll be talking about for the next two weeks. Listen to what somebody said. I went by the field of the lazy man. And by the vineyard of the man, the void of understanding. Look at what the man said. He says, I went by the field of a lazy man. How did he know that the man is lazy? Because you went by the field of a lazy man. He's not somebody you know, the way it's written. But he went by the field and he labeled the man a lazy man by what he saw in the field. He says, I went by the vineyard of the man, the void of understanding. How do you know the man doesn't have understanding? By what you saw in his vineyard. Let's continue. And there it was, all overgrown with tongues. So now, we're connecting why he said the man is a lazy man. Because in the field, it is not expected to grow tongues. And then the next, next thing he said is, the surface was covered with nettles. The stone wall was broken down. Now we understand why he called the man a lazy man. Because he has his field, number one, the field is supposed to be cultivated. It's not cultivated. And then the vineyard is supposed to provide vine and fruits. It is not producing that. So he says, this man is lazy man. I'm going somewhere today. You have no idea where I'm going. Trust me. Let's go on. When I saw it, I considered it well. That is, when I saw it, I could not ignore it. Because I said, this is absurd. What is going on here is not what is supposed to go on. And so it caught my attention. So I start to assess how what is supposed to be doing well is doing badly. I considered it well, and I looked at it, and I received instruction. That is, I meditated upon it. I considered what was going on. I'm saying, why is this like this? What is not supposed to be? Why is it like this? Go on, please. So I found out that the reason why it's like that is a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. It's interesting when you look at this text, you can just read the thing. It says a little. A little. So when you look at a little, it looks insignificant. It looks what you can ignore. It looks like it doesn't matter. But we found out that that little is what accumulated that this kind of scenario and situation happened. A little. What you could have ignored. Many times we ignore a lot of things. But it's little drops of water that surely makes the ocean. Go on. 
So shall your poverty come like a prowler. What it means is that unexpectedly, it says that poverty will come to a lazy man like a prowler. Somebody like sneaking on you. Suddenly shows up unexpectedly on you. And you, your need like an armed man. Another one say bandits. What it means is that whatever you have is stolen from you or is taken from you. This is a very interesting passage. Let's then look deeper into it. Let's go back to verse 30. When you look at this, if you look at the field in terms of the field, maybe we play football or whatever, then you've missed the point. The field is your life. The field is your life. The field is what you own because this man holds the field. So it is the field here represents your life, which you are in charge of, where positive things are supposed to grow and has potential to grow. It is a place that can be cultivated because whatever you cultivate in your life is what you are going to reap, is what you are going to get. And so for all of us, there are different fields of our lives. There is a field of marriage. There is a field of business. There is a field of career. There is a field of relationships with people. And so the man said, when I went past this life, when I assessed this life and I looked at this life, I concluded that this man is a lazy man. Why do you say he's a lazy man? A lazy man is an indolent man. A man who is adverse to work, who does not want to work. Who is always giving reason why he's not working. And a lazy person is somebody who doesn't care. He doesn't care. He looks at everything. The walls are broken down. He looks at the field filled with tongues. He looks at it filled with nettles and weeds. He doesn't care. Someone who is nonchalant. You look at your life and you are not challenged about it. A lazy man is an unmotivated person. You look at your life. And you see the way things are going, and you fold your hands, you do nothing about it. That's a field. Then he talked about the vineyard of the man. It's interesting that he said he's devoid of understanding. That is, the man has no clue of what to do. And the Bible says that if any man lacks knowledge, let him ask of God. Who gives what? Liberally. A God who does not hold back. To give you solution to your life. And so he says the man is devoid. Has no understanding. Yet it does not. He's too lazy even to look for understanding. He's too lazy to look at the, on the website. On the internet. And search about his business. And search about his life. He's too lazy. And so he says that I went by the life of someone. Who is lazy. And devoid of understanding. What's this, Bible tell, what's this person telling us? He's telling us that every time. We are lazy and devoid of understanding. What are we going to get in our lives? We are going to get tons and nettles and going somewhere today. What does vineyard mean? Let's go back. Vineyard. Vineyard is a place of fruitfulness because it's by their fruit you will know them. So if you pass a vineyard, the reason why you will know it's a vineyard is by the fruits that it produces. It could be Apple yard, it could be orange yard. But the reason is because what you see grow there is what tells you what the place is meant for. And so it's what we see in your life and the produce and the product of your life is what tells us what the potential that you have to do. And you have to, you have to give to this world. What is vineyard? The vineyard is a place of producing. It's a place of producing. That's what a vineyard is supposed to do. It's a place of glory. Because don't forget the story of uh, Jezebel, Ahab, and Naboth. Because of the beautiful vineyard that Naboth had, Ahab and Jezebel conspired to kill him. So vineyard is supposed to be a place of glory. So your life is supposed to show for the glory of God. We should be able to look at your life and say, this is surely a good life. But laziness will never make people to show forth the glory that is supposed to emanate from their lives. <clears throat> the vineyard is a place of making money. 
Why do I say that? It is a place of vine, of making wine, that is supposed to produce money for you. But now you, your listeners has left the place from producing money for you. Then you've got to do something about it. Let's move on to, to the next verse, verse 31. And there it was all overgrown. Please, everybody say overgrown, please. Please, can you say it one more time, overgrown? You know, overgrown simply tells us, when, you, when they say a place is overgrown, number one, it tells us the place is out of order. You've got to look at your life. Is your life in order or your life is out of order? You know, when God gave man the garden of his, he gave, uh, when God put man in the garden of Eden, because God never gave man the garden of Eden, there's something that the Lord told him, told Adam. He said, keep this. He says, maintain it. What does he mean by that? Make sure that it's always in order. Make sure that this garden is always in order. Because the garden and the jungle, like I always say, they all have the same thing. Whatever you can find in the garden, you can find it in the jungle. The difference between the garden and the jungle is that the garden is order. The garden, things are done orderly there. Things are what? The plants are well manicured. They are cut into shape. The weeds are removed. And that is what it's supposed, our life is supposed to be. So the first thing God showed man when he created man was that he put man in a garden. And don't see it as a garden in your house. It means that God put man in a place of order. So we tell women all the time, well, we want to get married. The person you want to get married to, is his life in order or out of order? Is his life overgrown with amazing weed and tons and tissues? You've got to always ask yourself. We ask the wrong question, do you love me? No, is your life in order? Because if your life is overgrown with all of these things, you are going to put me in a jungle. And if I live in a jungle, we both be animals to ourselves. You get that one later on. Unkept. That is what it means, overgrown. Unkept. It, 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 overgrown also means a place of disrepair. Is your life unkept? Is your life a place of disrepair? That when people look at it, they can see utter confusion in your life. Overgrown means also ugly to see. You don't want to see a place that is overgrown. You know, you know, I mean, with my background, I'm not just used to cutting grass or mowing lawn and all of those things. And so, when we first moved into our neighborhood, we kept getting letters from the community, from the association, saying that our grass is overgrown. For me, it didn't look overgrown. <laughs> but they said it was overgrown. And, uh, we will get the first one. A lot of times I don't open those association um, letters. And then there was a time I saw it. They said, this is the third and final warning that they will come and cut it and charge us for it. And so he tells me, why did they notice it? Because it is out of order. And because it's out of order, they said, your life that is out of order is affecting your neighbors. It's the same thing for us. Many of us, our life is out of order. It's affecting our family. Our life is out of order. It's overgrown with what is not supposed to be there. Overgrown also means excesses. We have all of these excesses that we deal with. Overgrown regrettably means that it could be better than what we are seeing. Then they told us, what is overgrown with? They say it's overgrown with tongues. What are tongues then? Because when ground is left fallow, <laughs> hardship is what tongues mean. Tongues means difficulties, pain. And so pain, an awful situation, will develop. That's what tongues are. The life is now being Let's look at something in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Let's see the effect of tongues on things. Because what it does is that tongues choke things, chokes life out of us. Here it says, now he who receives the seed among the tongues is he who hears the word. And the cares of this word gets distracted by multidimensional problems and issues in life. 
and the deceitfulness of riches, they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So where tongues are, unfruitfulness always follows. Because why? It chokes the life. It makes them difficult. We are struggling for life. We are struggling to, 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 to breathe and get here into your hair waves. That's what it means. Once the land is left fallow, what is supposed to be cultivated is not cultivated. You ignore it. This is what will happen. Let me say this one. Life abhors vacuum. Life does not like anything vacuum. Once there is vacuum, anything can grow there. Anything can happen there. You know, there's a story in the Bible, the parable that Jesus Christ gave. He gave the parable that, you know, a demon was cast out of someone. And then the person, the heart, the place was fresh, was garnished, and everything was going on well. Guess what they said happened? They said the demon went and what got more other demons to, to the place. And it was seven times worse than when it started. You check your own life. What is going there? Tongues makes things unproductive. What are tongues? Tongues are uncontrolled weed. Nobody plants it. It grows on itself. Tongues simply means what is not supposed or expected is what is growing there. Who grows tongues? Unless you grow roses that has tongues. Who wants to go? You say, I want to grow tongues. What do you want to use it for? What is growing in your life? Is it choking you? What's growing in your life? Is it affecting you? What's your field like? If you look at your field of your life, what are we going to see there? The next thing he said, go back, to, uh, let's go back to our text, please. Proverbs. Go to the next verse. So he says, was overgrown with tongues. And then he went on to say, its surface was covered with nettles. <laughs> you know, nettles, I mean, I could identify with this. Because where I grew up, we had, we had nettles. Nettles is, um, we call it also a devil being. You know, for those people who come from the southwestern part of Nigeria is what we call Wirikwe. You understand? You know what? The thing about nettles is that most fruits, it grows because it's like a fruit or um, whatever it is, they are best when they are fresh. Because who wants to eat a dry, uh, what's it called? A dry orange or an apple that is dry. But nettle's potency is when it's dry. And so what we used to do those days is that when it's dry, we, we find a way of getting uh, the hair that is, has grown on it. And then we put it in a, in a paper. You wrap it. So when somebody offends you, you go there and blow it upon them. It's only palm oil that is going to solve that problem. He starts to scratch himself. That's what nettles are. Is your life today covered with nettles? Stinging hair. What's nettle? What irritates? What annoys? Is your life filled with what provokes you? It means a person's life is covered with irritation. A person's life is covered with annoyance and provocation and anger. What is covering the surface of your life? When we see the surface, we have an idea what is inside and internal of you. When we see what you're producing on the outside, tons and nettles, we have an idea what's going on on your inside. Like I said, this covers not only covers different areas of your life. Your career, like I said, your business, your marriage, your relationships, different areas of your life, what is covering it? Verse 32 then said, he says, no, let, let's still look at that one and talk about the stone wall. Go back. So then he went on to say, a stone wall 
was broken down. Stone wall is different from brick wall. Stone wall means it's a fortified wall. A wall designed to be impregnable. That's what the wall is supposed to be. It's supposed to be for defense. It's supposed to be to make sure that the enemy does not come in. They described the wall of Jericho. They said when it was shot in, no one could go in. No one could come out. So it was their defense for the city of Jericho. But when the walls came down, the people, the children of Israel had unfettered access into the city of Jericho. And they were able to subdue and conquer them. So when walls are broken down, this is what happens. Because what is the stone wall for you and me? The stone wall for you and me is the word of God. That's what our defense is. It is our protection against the enemy. It is the word that gives us value and character. And so when the enemy comes like a flood, it is the word of God that becomes the standard in our lives. But when we don't have the word of God, the enemy has access to our lives. And what does he do? He can sow tears. T-A-R-E-S. He sows tears. He sows tears. T-E-A-R-S also. He sows it into our lives. He sows pain, frustration, and all of those things. He sows it into our lives. Why? Because there is no word of God to protect us from any of those things. When walls are broken down, the enemy sows hardship. And so this man said, I receive instruction. Why? Because he caught my attention. Why did he catch my attention? Because I'm looking at a life waste away. That's what the man is saying. I'm looking at the life. I'm saying, this is absurd. This is not what it's supposed to be. I've come to challenge you today. Are you, is your life wasting away? What is growing in your life? Is it tongues? Is it nettles, irritation, and action? Is that what is going on in your life? I've come to challenge you today. Because this man said, he caught my attention. I considered it well because I know this is not what this life is supposed to be. I remember when I was growing up, I always say that that was the reason why I never smoked hemp. Because every time while growing up, when my mom sees, you know, we don't see that kind of thing here, but you know, I grew up in Africa where mad men walk around the street naked and all of those things. And when you see a mad person, we, we know. You know, the interesting thing is that that's why people, you know, your hairdo, the kind of hairdo you have, you've got to watch it, especially you young ones. Because when people are mad, one of the first places you know is they're here. <laughs> one of the first places you know. Is that here? Yeah, that's how you know that this one is getting bad. But anyway, so <laughs> listen to this. My mom used to say, when well, we see a mad person, there's a statement she would say, she said, hmm, the day this person was born, they rejoiced. That's a deep statement. Saying, the day this person who is mad, when the mother had this guy, they were excited that a baby has come into their family. Can they rejoice at this life again? And then she will add that the reason why this person is like that is because he used to smoke hemp, Indian hemp. What do you call it here? We, we, eh? Weed. You know what you smoke. You know what the name is. But whatever, you understand it. So, you know, you, you know, so he used to say that that's what, that's what that person is. And so, while I was in college, two of my roommates were smoking. In actual fact, I've told some of us, my best friend, who is still my best friend, used to smoke heavily. And I never did one. He would say, take a puff. I said, no, I'm not going to. Because I always remember mad people walking naked. And I didn't want to join them. When we see people's lives that are suffering from nettles and tongues, don't let us join them. Let them always be an example for us. Let them be an example. Don't be that person that nettles and tongues is growing in your life. So I didn't want to. He used to tell me, uh -uh, why do you say that? I said, I don't want to be mad. He said, am I mad? Am I mad? Have I not been smoking since I'm mad? I said, that's you. That's not me. The trajectory of my life is completely different from yours. Better 
things should be planted in our lives. This is a vineyard that should be producing wine. That nature has covered it. The wine is supposed to be for everybody's enjoyment. It's supposed to be for everybody's excitement. But see what's growing in there now. But everything now is broken down. It has become an eyesore. That's what the life has become. And so the guy was taking an assessment of this. He looked at this life and said, this life is an eyesore. I don't want to be like this. This vineyard should be an envy for people. That's what the vineyard should be. That people will like to have this kind of vineyard. Let your life be an envy for people. That people will like to have a life like yours. The way your life should be is that you should be a role model. That's what your life should be. Even if you are not a role model to anybody, be a role model to your children. The man said, I found out that the protection was gone because the wall was broken down. He said, then what do I do? I received the instruction as to why it is like this. How did it start like this? Why has it ended? Or maybe the world's not ended. Why is it going on like this? He said, I meditated upon it. I received instructions. What does he mean by that? I receive instructions from God. I ask the one that sees the 360, who has the board's high view of everything. The one that sees all things, I ask them, how did this life become like this? How? The, with all the potentials that is embedded in all of us, how did our vineyard become filled with nettles? With all the potentials that is inside of us, how did our life become with all of these tongues and all this hardship, the pain and the hurt that we have? How did it happen like this? The man said, I, I needed to. Know how it happened like this. Maybe so it doesn't happen to me. Like I said, let other people be example. Don't be the example. A bad one, that's what I mean. So the man said, after I meditated, I believe God revealed the reason for me. Why the life is the way it is. I challenge you today. What is in your field? What's growing in your field? Those of you who are young and are students, what's growing in your field today? What's growing in your field? What's growing in your academics? I said this to students all the time. When I was in college, I was not serious. And I got what unserious people get. That's what I got. Because what was growing in my field as a student was nettles and tongues. But I didn't realize that it was nettles and tongues. I'm going to talk about this later on. He says, I did one thing, verse 33. I found out after I received the instruction, the instruction said the reason why this thing ended up like this is a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Like I said, he said a little. A little looks inconsequential. It looks like what you will ignore. It looks like what does not matter. So I said, like we said, no biggie. It's no big deal. Things will turn around. Oh, it will be okay. Kisera, sera. Whatever we be, will be. Things will happen. Maybe someday God will. Somewhere, somewhere, somehow, God will turn things around. And so instead of going into the field and the vineyard and removing the tongues, there is a folding of the hand. He said a little sleep. A small turn is what turns into the U-turn. It looks 
small. But it starts to grow. So today is one weed. No problem, I'll take care of it. Tomorrow is two. No problem. When I, there, there, I will have a day when I will clear out all, all the weeds. He said the reason is that it's a little. But it's a little that gets out of control. What is sleep? Like I said, we're going to have to continue this. What is sleep? What does it mean by a little sleep? Sleep is a regular suspension of consciousness. Is a, everybody sleeps. That's just the way it is. People just sleep. So it is natural for men to sleep. So sleep is what? A, a regular suspension of consciousness. But what causes sleep? I'm going to talk about three things, then I'll go to my seat. We'll continue from there. It is just natural for men to fall asleep. That's just the way we've been wired. So when we don't sleep, it's a problem. So, it's just natural. What does this mean, a little sleep then? It means that it is just natural for men, most of the time, not to be motivated, to be lackadaisical in their outlook, and to procrastinate what they are supposed to do. It's just natural. So without effort being put, you can stay awake. It's just natural for men to sleep. So one way or the other, many of us will have been conditioned just to be like others. Just to procrastinate. Just to say, I will get to it and never get to it. And then we wonder why tongues and nettles <laughs> are growing in our lives. We wonder why we are where we are. Number two, idleness. These are the things that cause sleep. Idleness causes man to sleep. Especially when you've eaten what uh, uh, people out of Nigeria or wherever call swallow. You know, it's just natural after you've eaten powdered yam. All the blood in the head, they just rush for an emergency help in the stomach. To help the stomach at, at what has just befallen the stomach. So once the blood leaves the head, it is just natural. You just need to sit down for a few minutes, you're going to sleep. So I do this, not doing anything. can cause sleep. And that idleness translates to your field being filled with tongues, difficulties, pain. That's what he ends up. The idleness, he ends up having nettles. You know, there's a proverb that says, nettles don't sow again. Because the one that sold last year, nobody has harvested it. Nobody knows that proverb here. Yeah? Oh, where do you people come from? Huh? That's a proverb. It's a saying. It's a, it's a saying from where I come from. They say because nobody harvests nettles. So they are saying nettles don't sow again, don't become fruitful again. Because the one you sowed last week, the one that was fruitful last year, nobody went to harvest it. It's still there. Because it's useless. Nettles is useless to anybody. Don't make your life useless to anybody. Do something about it, which is what I'm going to talk about in the second part about, of it. Number three, what causes sleep is overworking and tiredness, tirelessness. Working without understanding and wisdom. You walk like an elephant and eat. That's not what God asked for us. That's why you must be proactive about it. Because weeds will grow. Is it not amazing that weeds are so bad that if you have a concrete 
And if there is a crevice, just a slightest crevice or a small opening, weed will start to grow out of it. That's how weeds are. Give them small allow, they will take allowance. That's what weeds are. They just, they just grow. No, but you don't need to plant weed for it to grow. It's just natural. The way it's natural for men to sleep is the way it is natural for weeds to grow. Go and look at your grass, those of you who have built something. Go and look at the weeds. Did you plant them? When, they, when they, you planted the thing, or when you moved into the house, they planted grass for you. But the weed has shown. That's what happens. Jesus told that parable. They said that um, the disciples, he told the parable that they went to tell him that what we planted was wheat. But the enemy came and sowed tears. That's what the enemy does all the time. When God created you, he created you with potentials, with abilities. But the enemy has come and he has sown tongues and nettles and tissues and all manners of things. But you have allowed it to grow. You are the one who allowed it. Ow! A little sleep. A little slumber. And a little folding of the hands. God's plan for you and me is prosperity. It's for us to prosper. But how are you going to prosper when everything you are trying to do is being choked? by tongues and nettles. Slumber is dozing and half asleep. Slumbering just means in and out of consciousness. Not fully awake, not fully asleep. That's even a terrible thing. You are neither hot, another cold. Nobody knows where you stand. I'm out of time. I'm not out of time. Let's see if we continue from here. Let's bow down heads. <laughs> Heavenly Father, once again today we thank you. Heavenly Father, I have put the skeleton, had the flesh to eat in their hearts. There's many people who are here, Lord, today. You know what is going on our field. Spirit of the living God, motivate us to get up and clear our fields from what is not supposed to be there. We've folded our hands for too long. We've dozed for too long. We have slept for too long. It's time for us, Lord, to awake, to be awake. And do that which you sent us to this world to do and achieve. We declare upon everyone who has heard this message. That they will rise up and clear their fields. And so that which belongs to this field. That's what they will do. Lord. Let potentials come. Open their eyes of understanding Lord that they will see that which is embedded inside of them. That which you have given unto them. As many people who are devoid of understanding, you say you give liberally. Lord, give to them. Let people have directions back. Let people refocus and get back on track, Lord, with you. As many people that the walls are down, we pray heavenly Father that there will be a rebuilding like the walls of Jerusalem. Let them rebuild these walls that are down. And let glory come back to them. Let joy come back. Let fulfillment come back. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you've done. Explain this word to them much more than they, they have had. I don't know if there's anybody here today who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. I want to pray with you. The rest of us, let's think about our lives. Look at the different aspect of your life. Where are tons? Where are they growing? Young man, young woman, old man, old woman, look at your life. Where are tons and nettles? Where are they growing? It's time for you to weed out the tons. 
and the nettles. It's time for you. Don't let your life be overgrown with what is not supposed to be there. Father Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Let me say this. The weed that is overgrown, please don't forget what I'm about to say to you. The weed, the thorns, the nettles that is overgrown, suck the nutrients that is supposed to be used by what is planted. What you feel in your life that is causing the hardship. If it is channeled the right, if it is used the way it's supposed to be used, it will outgrow whatever weed. It will take the nutrients before the weeds take it. Please don't forget this. That overgrown with weeds and tons. That's how your life should stand out. It's not going to be overgrown. It's supposed to stand out. Your life is not supposed to stand out with tongues and nettles. Your life is supposed to stand out with the potential that God has given to you. But when potentials are not used, then the tongues and the nettles uses it. God bless you. I'm out of time. Thank you so much.